My name is Joe Stagg. In the next hour in this pre-recorded webinar, I will be helping Patterson Pumps to roll out their new Centralist VFD pump product. I will also be presenting the reason why Centralist VFD pumps can be so beneficial to you on your projects. Whether you're a design engineer, an installing contractor, a service contractor, a facilities operator, uh, even a sales rep, I will show you why Centralist VFDs can be so helpful. Uh, reasons of decreasing your, your upfront costs, uh, increasing your efficiencies, and just simplifying your system so that you can have a much better operating pumping system. For the first few minutes, I'd like to walk you through the PowerPoint that Patterson Pump has on introducing us to their intuition pumping system. Patterson Pumps is now happy to introduce their new Intuition sensorless VFD product. The Intuition is the most advanced variable frequency drive for pumping applications on the market today. Developed jointly by Schneider Electric and Patterson Pump Company, the Intuition drive and pump features intuitive variable speed pump control, multi-pump control for up to six pumps, onboard web servers, a QR code generation, and a snapshot view. What is intuitive variable speed pump control? Intuitive variable speed pump control utilizes a variable frequency drive that is manufactured by Schneider Electric and is equipped with logic that allows the drive to sense the speed at which it should operate based on input power, operating speed, and pump curve data. The logic utilizes the affinity laws and customer provided system curves to sense where it needs to operate without the use of external feedback such as pressure transmitters or even flow meters. There are two types of feedback, however, with the intuition drive. As we mentioned before, you can use the intuitive type operation or a sensorless type pump. We don't require any sensors and we'll walk you through how that works in this presentation. We can also connect the drive to a sensor, some differential pressure or pressure transducer that's coming back to the drive, providing feedback from the system. It could be a flow meter or a pressure transmitter of some sort. The nice thing is, is Patterson's intuition is capable of using either control. When we control the system, when we program that VFD, we have many different options on how we can set the operation of that VFD. Here lists a few. First, we can set it up with a constant flow control. So regardless of what's occurring in the system, the VFD is set to provide a constant flow rate. Next, we could set it up for constant head control. So regardless of flows or what's taking place in the system, the, the pumps and VFDs will give us a consistent head pressure or we can do a constant pump delta pressure control. We can monitor the differential pressures across the pump and the pump can, or the VFD will operate the pump to maintain a constant set point of pressure across the pump. Next is the constant system delta pressure control. This more commonly matches what we do on our systems. This would be some type of delta pressure across the system or across a coil or across a index circuit, a critical circuit. We'll watch that delta P and the VFD will slow down the pump in order to maintain that constant delta P or that constant differential pressure. And last, but by far not the least, is the quadratic head control. Here we see a quadratic head control curve. The points on this curve in the blue line are basically what we program into the drive. When we purchase a sensorless drive, we would program a design point. The design point would be our maximum head and pressure. It's provided by the customer and it's programmed into the drive at the factory. It's also adjustable in the field by startup technicians or qualified operators. Next is the zero flow head set point. If this is unknown on a project, it will assumed to be 40% of our design head. We can adjust this during startup. 
It can be adjusted by a commissioning agents. It can be adjusted later to give us a better turndown while maintaining balanced flows and proper operation within the system itself. The control curve becomes the quadratic curve that's calculated by the drive itself from the zero head condition to the pump design point using the pump affinity laws. And this is the curve that the pump will drive on. The biggest difference that exists between a typical VFD that is purchased for a installed pump or a pump that is provided with a sensorless drive is that this curve is pre-programmed by the manufacturer into the drive. So when you purchase a Patterson pump, vertical inline specific model, it will come with a specific drive. At no point can we take that drive off and put it on another pump because within that drive is programmed the parameters, the operational curves of that specific pump. So by setting our two points, our design set point and our zero flow, uh, our zero flow head set point, it now establishes the operational curve that that specific pump can operate on. So it's important to understand that difference and that is why we can have this pump utilize zero sensors. Because now with these conditions programmed in and as you can see on the bottom curve with all of the power set points controlled in, it is now able to monitor the total power, the total current, the total resistance, the hertz, of what that drive is currently experiencing. And by calculating, by running those and measuring those numbers, it can go back to the curve and it can calculate where on that system curve it is operating and where it needs to be and at what speed it can operate at. Now, with a standard VFD and a standard pump application, we don't have that luxury because this curve is not programmed into the drive. We could calculate, we could measure power and current and resistance, but we don't know, we don't have anything to base that back towards or compare it to. We don't have a curve that is programmed into that drive to be able to plot where we would be operating at. The power of the intuition really comes with the functionality and the abilities that the drive gives to us. With this multi-drive link, there's multiple options that really help us to provide the best system out there. The principle behind the multi-drive link is that we can take up to six drives and we can have them communicate one with another. We can set one of these drives up to be a master drive. The others would be set up to be the slave drives. We can control these or we can link them with a daisy chain or cascade type wiring. And that's what that topology shows. The architecture, again, allows us to use up to six drives. We have a master and up to five slaves. Another nice feature that the drive offers is the control if we lose the master drive. The slave drives can be set up as a secondary master that will take control in case the primary master fails or we have to take it out of the system for service. This can be programmed in the field by the startup technician or qualified operational technicians. The application functions used in combination, we have level control, booster control, and the quadratic curve control on multi-variable speed pump systems with or without sensor feedback. We have many different control abilities. We have many different drives working together in unison, driven by the master, driven by the set points that we program into that drive, to maintain the operating system as we see fit to maintain the highest levels of efficiency. This graphic shows how we would connect these drives together from the master to the slaves. All of our sensors would be run to and connected to the master drive. The slave drives would then be configured so that they listen to the set points that are being driven or controlled by the master. All the set points, all the programming is done on the master drive and is then transmitted and sent to the slave drives. We can run sensors if we'd like to utilize 
a pressure sensor or, or differential sensor of some sort back to the drive. If we didn't want to have a drive, if we wanted to use the intuitive or sensorless feedback, we could do that in lieu of using and utilizing sensors. The control of the drive gives us good wear, good equal run time. It gives us good staging and destaging management. It will help interlock the pumps and give us those pump statuses. We have multi-pump system monitoring. We can monitor all of these pumps. We can know what pumps are running, which pumps are off, what pumps we need to bring on next. We can affect this control. The system can drive these pumps so they're getting equal run time. Multiple points that this drive can give to us. In short, with the combination of Patterson pumps, high quality of pump manufacturing, and the intuitive design and uh, features of the drives manufactured by Schneider Electric, by combining the powerful sides of both manufacturers, Patterson Pumps is now able to provide the best, the newest sensorless VFD pump to the HVAC marketplace. So first off, as we get into this, I'm going to give us a typical closed loop hydronic system. We're going to pipe this in a direct return configuration. We'll locate our pump here, and we'll have four individual circuits. Now as much as we want to talk about high efficiency, at the end of the day, in the HVAC industry, our ultimate goal is to provide comfort. Yes, energy codes, ASHRAE standard 90.1, we're all being driven to high efficiency. However, it doesn't matter how efficient the system is. If we have uncomfortable occupants, we are all at risk of losing our job. So we must provide comfort. When we break down a circuit, a circuit consists of the following. We have our heat transfer device. In a heating system, this could be our hot water coil. This could be our hot water radiator. This could be a, uh, a fan coil unit, a reheat coil. It could be radiant heat in the floor. But this is our heat transfer device where we're transferring the heat. As the air moves across this device, we heat the air up to maintain the set point on our thermostat. We provide water in and out of this device so that we can provide comfort. We provide hot water for heating. We provide chilled water for cooling. As we want to control the, to the set point, we would introduce a control valve. This control valve, in a very simplified manner, would monitor the set point for the thermostat inside the room. As we start to approach that set point, the control valve would then begin to modulate closed so that we don't overshoot and become too hot. As it falls further from set point, the control valve would modulate open to provide more heating into that heat transfer device so that we could keep everybody comfortable within the space. Here I've drawn a two-way control valve. Also in the circuit, regardless of where you're at in the system, will be a balancing valve. This balancing valve is there to be set so that in this piping system, I have a direct return. If I'm a molecule of water and I'm sitting at the pipe at this location, why would I want to take circuit number one, circuit number two, circuit number three, or circuit number four? If I'm a molecule of water and I'm sitting at that location, I will take the path of least resistance in order to get from point A to point B. As the pump turns on, it creates a differential pressure. We have a higher pressure at point A than we do at point B. That change of pressure then induces flow. And we go from the high pressure to the low pressure. Now as that molecule of water is moving through the pipes, it hits that intersection. Why would it want to take path one versus path four? Because path one has much least resistance, much more, uh, much less resistance than we do at circuit four. So if these circuits, if these heat transfer devices and control valves have equal pressure drop across each one of these circuits, then we have a situation where I would want to take this path. If this circuit has a total pressure drop of 10 feet, I have 10 feet, 
I have 10 feet, 10 feet, and 10 feet. The water molecule looks at that and says, well, I could go down this circuit and have a differential or a resistance of 10 feet. Or I could travel all the way out here and go down this one. The difference is the pressure drop to get through this pipe and to get back. That's what this balancing valve has to be set to, is we now have to create a roadblock, create some resistance so that all of this pressure drop to get out to that circuit and to get back from that circuit makes it so it's equal to the resistance here. So let's put it in simplified terms. If it's one foot, one foot, one, 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 one. In order for the molecule of water to get from point A to point B, I could have a 10 foot loss, or I could have a three, six, and 10, a 16 foot resistance. What's the path of least resistance? It would be circuit number one with a resistance of 10 feet. It would, circuit number two would have a resistance of 10 plus two of 12 feet, 14 feet, and 16 feet. So I've got to create a balanced system. This balancing valve would be set to compensate for the difference in pressure. This balancing valve in this scenario would be set to six feet. This circuit now became 16 feet equal to this circuit. This circuit would have a balancing valve and it would also be set, but it would be set to something lower. In order to balance this circuit, which is now sitting at 12, I would have to add plus four so that I get 16. This would be set to four feet. This balancing valve would be set to two feet, and I would need a balancing valve here, if no other reason, so that I could verify flow. When I use a balancing valve, it can also be referred to as a calibrated orifice. A calibrated orifice allows me to have a high pressure and a low pressure port across that orifice where I can plug in a differential pressure gauge or differential pressure meter. And I can plug that in and look at the differential pressure across that orifice. And I can go back to the manufacturer's curves or charts for that balancing valve and it will tell me what the flow rate is at that pressure drop across that orifice. So it provides a means for being able to measure flow. Now if I have zero differential pressure across that, then I can't determine flow. For accurate flow reading, we would typically want an average or a minimum of about a three foot pressure drop, depending on the manufacturer that you use. So with a three foot pressure drop across that circuit, I could now determine flow. But now that extra three feet just drove this up to 19 feet, which means everything else has to equal 19 feet. So I added three here, I need to add three here, and three here, and three here. So as we affect one part of the system, we have to apply that across the entire circuit. Very Im important so that we can get balanced flow. All right, now let's lay out another system just a little bit different. On this system, we're going to make it more typical where we have different pressures. Again, in each circuit, I have a heat transfer device, a control valve, a balancing valve. We will also have our isolation valves, and we will tie into the system itself, our hot water supply and our hot water return. And then we'd have to look at point C to point D, and what is the total resistance in order to get flow through that circuit. So here I have a pump, and that pump creates a differential pressure, a high pressure and a low pressure. And the water will travel from high pressure to low pressure. We then hit the circuits. These circuits each have a heat transfer device. We have control valves. On this further circuit, we're going to use a three-way control valve so that when we're, not, when we're not flowing through the coil, we flow around the coil and that will provide a minimum flow through the supply and through the return. We'll also put in our balancing valves. And we'll then set up the system. Now, 
as an engineer sizes the heat transfer device, we have to look at the heat loss within the space. If it's a chilled water coil, then we have to look at the heat gain into the space. And this coil will be sized for the worst case condition. If it's a hot water system, we look at the design temperature of the area of where we're living. And what is that coldest temperature of the year that we have to design for? When it's that cold outside, then we lose more heat across the surface of the walls. And as we lose more heat, we have to put more heat into the space to keep the occupants comfortable. This has to be sized for the worst case condition of the year. So we would contact the coil manufacturer and say, Mr. Coil Manufacturer, I need a coil that's going to give me X amount of BTUs in this space, designed for the hottest or the coldest day of the year. The reality is, is we don't spend very much time at the coldest day of the year. If I were to look at a load profile, across the x-axis, this would be a rate of time. Let's say this time is January through December. On the y-axis, this is the percentage of load. Now, if it's a heating system, what does our load profile look like? Well, we're sitting here in January, we're very cold, we have a very high profile, and we start getting into the spring months, our load drops. But in the summer months, we have some reheat conditions. So we still have some heat in the summers that we have to add, and then we get into the fall, and our load starts to climb, and then we hit December. I size these coils for the worst condition of the year, and that is right here. And that is our 100% load. On average, we spend about 2% of our time at that condition. In other words, only 2% of the year I will spend with every one of these valves at 100% open providing 100% heat. The rest of the year, these valves will be modulated down to some lower proportional rate because this is where we spend the majority of our time, is in that range. So our system's gonna be operating at much lower loads. That's a reality. This is how the human body works. This is how we provide comfort in Comfort HVAC. This is called a very diversified load profile. So now, what's going to happen inside this coil? Well, if I size this coil so that at, at that design condition, when I have full flow, that coil has uh, a pressure drop of moving that water through, a pressure drop of, let's say, 15 feet. Let's say my flow rate in that coil is 10 gallons per minute. 10 gallons per minute moving through that coil that the coil manufacturer sized for me, I will have a pressure drop of 15 feet. Then we hit the control valve. Now this brings up a whole other topic of conversation that we simply don't have time for, but that is how do we size the control valves? Who sizes the control valves? More often than not, I'm told the controls contractor sizes the control valves. Sadly, that is not what should be happening. As design engineers, design engineers should be sizing this so that we know what our total pressure drop is. When we design a project and we turn that over to the controls contractor, this isn't even decided until after the job's designed, when the job's being installed. And now we don't even know what our total pressure drop is. The engineer should be using control valve authority techniques to size this control valve so that we have proper controllability. Now when we size control valve authority, we would size it so this valve has 30 to 50% of the total pressure drop through the circuit from point C to point D. This valve would have 30 to 50% of the total pressure drop across this circuit. So if it was just the pressure drop across the coil, for 50% control valve authority, I would size this for 15 feet. But then I have this guy, and I have the piping, and I have the service valves. This guy, if I did 15 feet, the one that's closer that has nine feet here, I've lost my control valve authority. For this guy that only has three feet, I maintain my control valve authority. So it's important to adjust this 
If this was the case, and I want 50% control valve authority, then that would be 24. I would want to build 24 feet of pressure drop across that. And now I've maintained my 50%. But what about this? I might have another two feet of pressure drop through the entire circuit itself, through the piping, through the, the service valves, and then I've got the nine feet. So let's take that. Let's take the 15 through the coil. Let's take the nine through the balancing valve and the two through the piping and service valves. And what do I have? I now have 11 and we have 26 feet. So if I want control valve authority in this really good control valve authority, I would build 26 feet into that. The pressure drop across that control valve. And that would give me a total of 52 feet and I would have 50% pressure drop for my control valve authority. Now that might be too much head pressure, so we might start to back that down. The second we drop below 30%, I now lose my controllability, and I'm giving up that valve's controllability. And as that valve tries to close at the high end, I don't get the controllability that I want. And so now my flow does not control until that valve starts to get to 70, 60% closure, and then we start to control flow. And that's not an efficient system. So as engineers, engineers need to make sure that they're sizing these control valves. An important step in the process. And now we start to come up with our total head loss through each circuit. And we start to lay that out for each circuit. So if we take the balancing valve out of question, and we take this into consideration. Let's go with uh, let's go with the thirty. Uh, let's go with the fifty percent. Let's do it like a normal con most controls contractors will do. Most controls contractors will say, "I'm going to match the pressure drop through the coil." So if this is fifteen feet, then I'm I'm going to give a fifteen foot pressure drop through the control valve. They won't even know what this is in the balancing valve because the engineer hasn't done all of these calculations. So then I know I have two feet through the piping. So this equals 32 feet. So let's say circuit number one equals 32 feet. Okay, we do the same thing on the next one. Let's say this one, circuit number two, equals 28 feet. Circuit number three equals 34 feet. And circuit number four equals 30 feet. Now, we need to balance the system. What's this balancing valve going to be set to? Well, first of all, we have to identify the worst case circuit or what I call the index circuit. The index circuit would be circuit number three. Based on what we see here, circuit number three has the highest pressure drop at 34 feet. Next, we would start to, uh, we would start here. I want this circuit to equal the rest. So now we have to look at the pipe loss, the pressure drop through the piping. So as we look at the pressure drop through the piping, we would say, okay, let's, let's just figure I've got a one foot and a one foot, a two foot and a two foot, and another one foot and one foot. All right, so if I want these to be balanced, what would I do? Well, we would take and add this up. So for circuit number three, we have circuit number one, circuit number two, circuit number three, and circuit number four. We're going to put an I right here because this is our index circuit, worst case. All right, circuit number one is 32. Circuit number two is one to get there, one to get back, so one plus one plus 28, which equals 30. 
Circuit number three is one plus two, plus two plus one, plus 34. So we're going to say three plus three plus 34 equals 40 feet. And circuit number four is one plus two plus one, plus one plus two plus one. So that is four plus four plus 30 feet. That equals 38. So I've now built another system. Clean that up here. I've now built another system where this is still my index circuit. Now, there could have been a situation where this was 2, and this was 2, and that made this 6 plus 6. I'm sorry, that made it 5 plus 5. So 5 plus 5, and now that equals 40. Now I have two circuits that are critical. I would have two index circuits. If this were 6 plus 6, then I would have 32, or four, I'm sorry, 42. And now this becomes my index circuit when everything's flowing. So now I've created a situation where I have one index circuit and two index circuits. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, let's go back to what we had and say 4 plus 4 and 38. All right, this balancing valve. We have to f identify, first of all, the worst case. That's 40. On this one, I would set this to 3 feet so I could maintain balance. So that's, or so I can measure flow. So that's plus three, that's 43. I need this circuit, number one, to equal 43. So I would have to add plus 11. We would put 11 feet into that, control, into that balancing valve, 43. On this one, we have 30 feet. I need 30 feet to get to 43 feet. So I have to add plus 13 feet, and that equals 43. So I have to pro, uh, set this to a 13 foot differential pressure. This one's already at 43. This one's at 38. So I have to set this one to 5 feet. Plus 5 equals 43. So now I've balanced the system. Now I know what pressures each one of those valves have to be set to. And I've identified my index circuit. OK. This is how the system operates. 2% of the year. This is how the system operates when I'm at my 100% design condition. Everything's 100% open and everything is balanced. But what's happening the rest of the year? The rest of the year, these valves are modulated down. My flow rates are no longer the same and everything becomes unbalanced. And this brings up a whole other discussion that we could have on the types of balancing valves we use. Do we use manual balancing valves? Do we use automatic flow control valves, uh, flow limiting valves? Or do I use pressure independent control valves? A whole other discussion that we could have. But for this discussion, it doesn't matter. For this discussion, we just want to recognize that I will be here I will be right here at 2% of the year. So when this valve opens to 100%, I have to give it 10 gallons per minute, whatever we designed. So when this opens to 100%, I must have 10 gallons per minute. In order to provide 10 gallons per minute across this circuit, that pump must deliver 43 feet of head pressure. I must have at least 43 feet of pressure across that circuit. Now this goes back to a balancing discussion. Back in the 60s, we came up with a standard, a rule of thumb for a balanced system. And that rule of thumb is, Plus or minus, let's do this right over here, plus or minus 10% of 
of design flow. That means at any given time, regardless of what my control valves are doing, I will be plus or minus 10% of the flow rate that we want there. So with this control valve goes to 100% open and I'm only delivering 8 GPM, that is only 8, uh, I'm sorry, that's greater than plus or minus 10%, that's minus 20%. So by definition, I'm no longer balanced. So in order to maintain a balanced system, when this control valve goes to 100% open, I have to have 43 feet of head pressure. If I'm only providing uh, 35 feet of head pressure, well, I could take that and apply that to the affinity laws, and I could determine what the new flow rate is. But I can tell you right now that if I'm only giving it 35, chances are I'm no longer within my plus or minus 10% tolerance. So any time this valve opens to 100%, I must have a minimum pressure of 43 feet. That is what I call our minimum control head. This is our minimum control head. That minimum control head is the set point at which that VFD must maintain. So my pump can no longer ramp down below 43 feet because if my pump ramps down to 35 feet because I'm not controlling it properly and this valve goes to 100% because uh oh we got cold in that room, I, yeah, I'm not getting the 10 GPM anymore. I'm not within my balanced flow or my balanced condition. So I get uncomfortable occupants. I'm trying to be efficient because I'm trying to save energy, but I'm creating uncomfort and that is inefficient and that causes me to lose my job. So we need to make sure that we're providing comfort. We need to make sure when this control valve opens to 100% that we maintain this minimum control head so that we maintain flow. Now, there are other ways around this. We can utilize more expensive controls. We can monitor positions of our control valves. And we could say, hey, our control valve positions are all closed to less than 90%. So I could start to reset or change my control head. But now we're looking at higher costs on controls and algorithms and programming. And yeah, we can chase that rabbit down that hole if we want to. Or if we want to keep it simplified, we just say, my pump can never provide less than this across that index circuit. So let me show you what that looks like. So we're going to draw a pump curve. On the x-axis, this is our flow rate. On the y-axis, this is our pressure. And our pump curve would look something like this. And here is my design condition. What is that design condition? Well, let's make it simple. Let's say every one of these are 10 GPM. So my pump would be sized for 10 gallons per minute per circuit, so what's that? That's 40 GPM. All right, what is my design pressure? Well, I know that it was 43 uh, to maintain all of this, but then what does it take to get to this spot and this point? What is that pressure? Let's call this another two feet and two feet through that piping. So we would add four feet to this 43 plus four. So my pump would be 43 plus four to equal 47 feet of head. But now, this is where we would apply safety factors. In the ASHRAE guidelines, it tells us that once we've calculated our head pressure, we now need to add 20% of extra head pressure. This is not to account for our mistakes in engineering. We need to make sure that our engineering numbers are accurate. But what it states in the ASHRAE guidelines is that this is here to account for the pipe becoming more rough tomorrow.
This would be the head pressure when I turn the pump on today. It would cost me 47 feet of energy to move 40 GPM through that system. However, what's it gonna cost me tomorrow? Because what's happening inside of the pipe? I'm forming scale, I'm eroding the pipe, I'm building up deposits, and as I do that inside the pipe, the internal wall becomes more rough. And our pipe roughness factor goes up. And as our pipe roughness factor goes up, our friction loss to move the same flow rate also goes up. So today, I could move 40 GPM at 47 feet of head, but tomorrow, in order to move 40 GPM, it might cost me 47 and a half feet of head. It depends on my water treatment, what I'm moving through the pipe, my maintenance requirements, or my maintenance, my maintenance uh, services. What am I taking? How am I taking care of the system? So this 20% allows us some time so that the system will always be able to, uh, well, and for the next foreseeable future, be able to give us at least 40 GPM. So I've added 20%. Well, 20% to 47 is roughly, let's just say eight and a half, plus let's round up to nine. Uh, no, it would be nine, let's round up to nine and a half, let's say 10, we're gonna add 10 feet of head. So we're gonna say that's gonna be 57 feet of head. So my pump would be sized for 40 GPM at 57 feet. Okay, that's my design condition. How often will I operate at that condition? Some people would say, I will spend 2% of the year there based on the load profile. But today, tomorrow, for the next foreseeable future, I will never operate here because of this extra 20%. I've oversized my pump and I will never, never need to provide this condition. So what ends up happening is we get out on the site. The, co uh, the uh, commissioning agent, the balancer, they look at the balancing valve on the discharge side of the pump and they throttle that forward to add this extra 10 feet because I'm operating out over here. I don't have that much head pressure. And so I'm getting too much flow rate. I'm getting 45 GPM. And at 45 GPM, I'm overflowing the system. And when I overflow the system, I'm costing too much energy. So we go ahead and add that extra head pressure by closing the valve and it pulls me back to this condition. And that is why we're not supposed to do that. That is why we should be using VFDs because the VFD can instead say, okay, here's my actual point of operation. Here is my system curve. Now, instead of operating here to give me 40 GPM, I would slow down here and I would operate here. What's that new head pressure? And now my pump is operating at a much slower speed and we're conserving a lot of energy. But this requires some programming. Somebody has to set this. Otherwise, we start to control or, sh or use valves and waste energy. Instead of operating way up here and costing all of this energy on our horsepower lines, if I were to draw some horsepower lines through here, they might look like this. So let's, let's just for, uh, for numbers, let's throw um, five and three. Five horsepower, three horsepower. Here, I'm gonna be about four. Here, I'm gonna be less than three. So I'm already saving a lot of energy. We could go apply this to the affinity laws and we could calculate how much energy we're conserving by using a VFD. Slowing it down here instead of pulling it back here. And we're conserving energy. Now, let's go ahead and redraw this. Based off of this system, my curve is going to look like this. Here's my design point, and this is 40 GPM at 57 feet, and I now need to say, at this point, I can never provide less than 43 feet.
Because if I do, and it opens to 100%, I'm unbalanced. So now I have to find my 43 feet on this chart. If this is 57, let's say 43 is about right here. 43 feet. And I have to draw a line. And I have to say, OK, pump, don't ever operate in this zone. Because if you do, you're providing too little pressure, and I will not be able to maintain flow across that index circuit. This now becomes my minimum control head. I can't operate down here. I would next need to ice or uh, locate my differential pressure sensor whoops, across this circuit right there. And I would set that to 43 feet. That would be run back to the VFD. And the VFD would drive the pump to always maintain 43 feet. So if I'm maintaining 43 feet here, and this control valve opens more because they're not comfortable, we start to put more heat there. What happens? Well, this pressure drop in this piece of pipe now sees more flow go through it. So the pressure drop goes up. As this goes up, my 43 goes down to 42. And the VFD says, whoa, my pressure drop just dropped, or my delta P just dropped to 42. So it speeds the pump up to give me 43. So now I know I'm maintaining pressure here, and I'm accommodating for that extra flow that's being used. But then this circuit right here says, yeah, I don't need as much flow anymore, so I'm going to start throttling down. And as I throttle down, I'm now forcing that flow that was going through this circuit. This closes. I'm forcing flow through this. Instead of being one foot, it goes up to a foot and a half, two feet. And as that goes up, my differential pressure gets higher. And we're, much, or we're, we're higher than 43. We go from 43 feet to 44 feet. And the VFD says, oh, wait, I only need to be 43 feet, so go ahead and slow down. So we're establishing a curve that looks like this, our system curve. And we're saying, as the pump needs to slow down, we ride this curve. But I can't operate down here. We can't do this. So then we start to ride this curve, and our curve starts to look like this. So my pump will never operate in this zone because I need to maintain comfort. I need to maintain balancing. I need to maintain uh, proper pressure, differential pressure at that 100% valve open. So I now start to ride this. This is a hard reality in our systems. This is why we look at a VFD and a closed loop hydronic uh, heating, and comfort, uh, <laughs> heating and cooling comfort system. And we say that this pump will never turn down more very rarely turn down more than 50% speed because it will be limited in this range because of the head pressure across this circuit. This circuit drives our minimum control head. Now, as engineers, we need to be doing this. As engineers, we need to be calculating these differential pressures. We need to be sizing our control valves. We need to know where that index circuit is. We need to locate the differential pressure across that index circuit. If we want a high efficient system that's operating properly, we need to do these steps. But the reality is that engineers are not paid by the hour. Engineers are paid by the project. And so we try to cut as many corners as we can so that we can be profitable on our job. I don't have time to size all of these control valves. Well, we might want to look at pressure independent control valves then. But I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to identify where that circuit needs to be. If we would have gone here, where, I had to, where this was 6 and 6, and now I have two index circuits, well, guess what? In a good, efficient system, I would have needed a sensor across this circuit and a sensor across this circuit. Two sensors with two different set points that are driving the system. I've done projects with up to eight sensors in high efficient systems. And that's going to allow us to turn the pump down even further so that we can save our operational costs even more. But that's the reality. 
And if we're not doing it, if our specifications say, well, go ahead and locate the sensor two thirds down the pipe. So we're gonna just locate it around here. Or put it at the end of the circuit. Or put it across the mechanical room. If I don't have the money or the time in my job as a design engineer to go through these motions, to go through these steps. And again, the, the hard reality is if I do an elementary school with a VAV reheat, I'm talking potentially hundreds of coils. And as I have all of these coils, I've got to do this for every one. I've got to calculate all of these, these pressures so that I can identify what my minimum control head is, so that I can figure out what I need to program that drive to. If we don't do that as engineers, who's going to do it? Is the balancer? Is the installing contractor? Is the guy who's starting up the pump? Who do we want to pass that responsibility off to? That's the question, because it has to be done. I get on many projects where I'm out there working on the drives and I find that nobody set this right. And it was set too low. And what happens? Well, the teachers are complaining. The hospital staff, they're complaining. We're not comfortable. So somebody goes in and they just start bumping up the minimum speed on that drive. They're driving this higher and higher. It's not at a set point that we as the design engineers established because we didn't establish anything. So we're losing the efficiency of that system. If we want to maintain it, we have to design it. We have to identify it. We have to program it. We have to go back in after it's been programmed and make sure that it's been programmed right. Somebody has to run the wiring all the way from the mechanical room out to that specific coil or to the specific coils, the specific circuits. If I have multiple index circuits, it takes time, money, effort on our part to make it happen. This is why I believe as an instructor who teaches HVAC courses all across North America, this is why I believe sensorless pumps are so important. If I don't have the time to do this, and, and trust me, the projects I see across the country, very few people have the time and ability to do it properly. Dr uh, pumps and separate drives are not getting programmed properly. Sensors are not being located in the proper location. We're decreasing the efficiencies of our system. And I see it. And if it's being done that way, well, darn it, we're just not taking control of that system. And that's what a sensorless drive can do for us. If I just say, you know what? Scratch it. Forget it. I don't have the time. I don't have the ability. I don't have the staff. I don't have the money in the project. Let's put a system in here that doesn't need the sensor. Let's put a system that has the VFD mounted to the pump that has the pump curve programmed into the pump. And then, once we identify the pump curve, we'll identify our program points. So just like the pictures we had at the beginning of the slide, I'll show it to you again here. And then we'll draw a curve here. We would program into that drive the pump curve. We would program the, the maximum impeller trim and reference trims. We know the minimum. We know the maximum. We know our uh, operational point. This is our design point. We come down here, we program. And if we don't know, because nobody set this up, if we don't know, well, at least the pump comes with a 40% set point. So 40% of my design head, not quite half, would be right about here. So once I've established these two points, using the affinity laws, we would now calculate our system curve. And the drive, the intuition pumping system by Patterson Pumps will now plot this curve. And as this curve is plotted, the pump will now operate to drive to set point. But guess what? The pump was oversized by 20%. I program, or we program into that pump, 
the maximum flow rate. We program this in. We don't program in a head pressure. We go in and we program the flow rate that we want. And we say that's what our maximum set point is, not this 57. So the pump's already going to reduce its speed to give us that actual point. And then as the, the response of the system, as we're watching the pressures, uh, as we're watching the current that's going through the system, as it responds, we're going to drive us down this system curve. And this is where we would set our minimum control head. We don't operate down here. So if 40% is not good enough, then that needs to be identified and we need to move that up. If, it's, if, it's, uh, if we can drop even lower, we can drop it down here and we can set it to another level. But this is establishing our minimum control head. This is establishing our design point. And that's all we have to do. If I still want to take the steps to run a sensor, this is the most efficient way to do it, is to go through the engineering process because we know precisely what pressure we need. But if I can't take that time, if I can't make that effort to do that, this will do it to the best capacity possible. And if I want to incorporate both, I can still use the same intuition control with a sensor out to that point, and we program our set points. So in closing, sensorless VFDs have become a necessity on many projects in today's reality because engineering is becoming more difficult because of high efficiency. It's not like the good old days where efficiency wasn't driving us. It's not like the good old days where we just designed for 2% and the system just ran hard all the time. We want to satisfy the load profile of the building. We want to make sure that we have efficiency at that 2% of the year and the rest of the 98% of the year. And if we want to drive that efficiency, we have to design the system. But if we don't have time to drive a large system, in this short one hour, we laid out a small four circuit system. But if I had a multi-circuit system with hundreds of circuits, tens of circuits, I've increased my time. And then what about the deviations that the contractor does in the field? What if he has to move the pipe around a beam? Or he installs the wrong control valve. And all of these control numbers, all of these pressure numbers that we figured in our design aren't reality. Well, now we have another problem. And now it probably needs to be re-engineered again after the fact. Very important concepts as we lay this out. That's why sensorless VFD pumps, these smart pumps, the intuition by Patterson pumps, can do this job for us. We don't have to do it. We program it in. It knows the pump conditions. It reads the current. It reads the conditions of the system and can plot its points. And I don't need a sensor. I can still use one if I want to, but I don't need to. And I can tie this into up to six pumps and run it through a daisy chain, cascade controls. And this can now drive multiple pumps to maintain our desired set point. We're now getting to a, a point where the pumps, the heart of the system, are no longer the weak links in the system. You look at any control plant, any, any central plant of a building, and you look at their controls. We've got very sophisticated controls for the chillers and for the, the boiler system. But when it comes to the pumps, we've got nothing. The pumps just sit there, and they're just running and we might have a VFD, but we've got a sensor across the mechanical space. The worst possible option. And these pumps have very little turndown. We don't know where they're at. We don't know where they're at on the curve. We have no clue what's going on. This is the step in the right direction. We're now putting controls on pumps that we can monitor. On the heart of the system, we're now able to control it more precisely. And we're able to really know what's going on and monitor it. It's now bringing everything up when it comes to the pumps to the rest of the control platform in the building. This is the way that engineers should be going. Installing contractors should be installing. 
Facility operators should be operating. This is the way that we should be driving so that we can overall drive up our efficiencies and decrease our costs. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me, uh, to talk to your Patterson rep, to discuss the uh, Patterson Intuition pumps. I really believe that this is a good solid product. I appreciate Patterson pumps asking me to present this information to you. And I hope that you feel that this one hour has been a benefit to you. If you have questions, please reach out to your local Patterson representative or feel free to call Patterson Direct at their Tacoa, Georgia plant.